This is Don't Get Me Started. This is a conversation about advertising. And here is your host, freelance creative director and creative circus department head, Dan Balser. So welcome back to another episode of the podcast. Um, keep doing them. I'll, as long as you guys keep, keep listening, um, I'll keep doing them. And uh, as long as you keep sending me, I'm talking to the internet now, hmm. as long as you keep sending me names of people to be on the podcast, I will do my best to accommodate but uh, this one did not come from a PR agent. This one did not come from the ether or the internet. This one came from, uh, from our heart and soul. This was a, this is an alumnus. This is an old friend. I, I consider Steve Nathan's a friend. I don't know that it's reciprocal. I don't, I don't care. Um, for me, just to have someone that I count as a friend in my life, it means something to me. That may not be reciprocal, and that's, that's okay. I've gotten to the point in my life now where I can have friends that don't consider me friends. It's fine. It's fair. It's good. To me, it's good. It gives me a little bit of joy. You know, the, uh, the animals that you eat for lunch don't know that they're sustaining you, but they do. I don't know what, that got dark. <laughs> that got dark really quick. That got dark really quick. That, was, that one goes out to all the vegans on the other end. So Steve Nathans is a, uh, he's a copywriter, and uh, he's a copywriter that gives a shit about words. Um, he's a copywriter who came into this industry from, from the world of law as an uh, actual legitimate working attorney. Um, he graduated from the Creative Circus Advertising School and Portfolio Program um, in something around 2008. So we're looking at, uh, you can do the math on that one, folks. Um, he then worked at Goodby Silverstein and Partners for a good solid half a decade. Um, that's a feather in anyone's cap. He was a great group for a while. I can't do the math because the way LinkedIn breaks this mm. into separate job titles, but three it looks like change. three and change. Okay. Then um, Gray San Francisco. And where he is now in San Francisco at DDB, formerly DDB Needham, <clears throat> formerly Doyle Dame Burnback Needham, um, as a uh, creative director on, we're going to talk a little bit about the, what the work he works on is, but um, it's a small agency that's part of a big network. So it's got, uh, I, think, I think just talking to Steve at lunch today, it does feel like there's a sort of a limberness flexibility to, to being in a smaller shop. I want to get to that. But before we get to, into all the details, let's just hear from Steve. Steve, man, welcome back to the circus. Thank so you. good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. I can't believe I'm back. Why? I would, I, it's, it's weird to leave a place and then come back 14 years later. You haven't been back at all, have you? I haven't been back at all. I, and then I, it was funny, before I even got here, I was like trying to remember in my mind where the bathrooms were. Right. And then I was like, why can't I, did I not use the bathroom in the two years I, I, I was here? Do you ever think about that when you're watching a movie? Like, do they ever go to the bathroom? Like in a movie where they never take a bathroom break? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, or like, what, or like uh, in the Bourne Identity, like Jason Bourne, I, there was like one scene where he was eating a croissant, but like, is that it? That's all he had. That's all he needed. Okay. Jason Bourne. Yeah. He just, right, it's part of his training. Um, so is it, was it like surreal? Was it like, does the school feel dirtier does it feel the same it's kind of a mess like the place is kind of a mess so what what's your impression when you walk back in today like how, how does it feel to be back um it, yeah it feels a little like like weird out of body um right. you know as as i started walking the halls like the memories started coming back i started thinking of sylvia and so on um and and the stories came back and then i saw the bathrooms and i was like i really don't remember using them <laughs> and um no, it's it's it, it's great. It took it took a while to just settle in. It's weird at first, you know. Yeah, it's a, it's a little awkward, um, but now having had a chance to spend some time here, yeah, that's yeah. cool. Um, Sylvia, for those of you who don't know, um, taught like the sort of weed out hardcore design class to designers, and kind of was a foundational part of the experience for any, especially designers and art directors who went through the school. So, um, I want to talk uh, unscripted. I don't really have a. a a list of questions. There's some things I want to hit on, but one of them is my memory of you and the story that I tend to tell of you is of a guy who found his creative footing in school. Um, I kind of give you as an example of someone who, I think when people come into to an ad program like this, there's an expectation in their minds that everyone around, surrounded around them is going to be really creative and I'm going to hit the ground running. It's going to be great. And if I don't, then I'm probably not as good as they are, or never will be. But Wow, did the listeners just hear one of our stomachs growling? Yeah, I think that was mine. I don't know if the listeners I'm not that. hungry, strangely. 
Hmm. So the uh, but the way it's supposed to work, um, that's great if it works that way. It also sometimes works where like you actually get here and learn the thing, novel yeah. novel thought at a school, and um, develop your ability. So I did. I almost asked this question in forum for everyone to hear. But like when you got here, I remember a guy and. This could be like revised memory, the way I see it. Like I see you as a guy in a starched dress shirt who did the right thing, but didn't really play with the edges and irreverence and creativity until I have referred to you this way as if one day, and I'm going to ask you if I'm right in a minute, one day you gave yourself permission to apply your intelligence in a twisted way. And hmm. it kind of it kind of came out as if it was just that kind of this dormant flood of creativity because you gave yourself permission at some point to not be either correct or safe. I don't know if that's how you're, you experienced it, but for me it felt like you, it really was almost like there was a line in the sand where you went from being you know, lawyer Nathans to creative Steve. Okay, well, that's okay. I, I, let me tell you how I remember it. His eyes are closed. By the way. Um, I, re I remember a few things that you said to me. That, that were impactful. Uh, one was after my first quarter and we were doing our, is it called like our review mm -hmm. or panel right? panel? Mm -hmm. You were on my panel. You know, it's funny. You mentioned the start shirt and you said to me, uh, look at how you're dressed. Is that, you want to be the account guy? <laughs> Something to that effect? Or like, is that what you want to do? And I, I thought I was like, Oh, I was like, this is supposed to be about the work, but you know, you were onto something, right? Like, I mean, I mean, that was the world I had, I, I had come from. I was trying to show my respect for the process, but you know, you had also said along the way, like, let your hair down. Mm -hmm. Um, and I hadn't at that point. Um, and then further, you know, in the later quarters, you had said, don't be afraid to embarrass yourself. That is something I remember to this day. Um, and that is something that I think I did not, it, that took me years and years to understand, you know, working. That's interesting. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, it's funny because we talked about Lance, uh, working with Lance, Lance Parrish, who, who was my partner at Gray, also a circus grad. Lance was, Lance was good at that. Lance was good at, um, Lance didn't care if he embarrassed himself. Yeah. He, he would embarrass me and, 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 uh, he also didn't care, but, but Lance, I, Lance was the center of the party in a country song. Like he was just the guy letting his hair down yeah, on a Friday. Yeah, he was that guy. Yeah. He was that guy. Yeah, yeah. Pickup truck with a cooler full of cold ones in the back. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and in, a, in a way, we couldn't be more different, and mm -hmm. that that was a good thing. And um, Lance w wasn't afraid to put it out there. And I think that was a, a moment I realized, like, it's not just about being, um, it, it's not just about uh, uh, saying what's on your mind. It's about not letting that get in the way of your creative thinking. Even if you think something, this might be stupid. I don't know if I should say it. I should say it. Yeah. I should say it. You've been buttoned a little bit. You kind of left here looking younger than when you came. Yes. I, 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 I do think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's funny that you say that, like, uh, we were on panel and you thought it was going to be about the work. It's almost, to me, I don't know if I'm oversharing my own personal view or whatever, but, like, I kind of feel like, it's about the work secondarily to about the person you're sitting across from. And to me, I feel like the industry is about people. And for me, I kind of feel like my role is more of a mentorship about personal development than it is about, it's, it's really important that the craft is good. It's really, really, really important. Like I'm not, I'm not under, underselling that, but to me, that's something that anyone can talk about or whatever. And like, I don't think many people in their adult years are kind of shown a, such a, mirror as this thing can create for you mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh I, th I don't know i just think that's important but i love that you remember that thing about embarrassing yourself because uh it's one of my huge mantras i think it's really really important it's the, it's the only place where cool stuff comes yeah i mean I, I i you know if i was doing a longer list of things i had learned in in to share and forum i would have included that one for sure yeah um and it, it's kind of it's kind of uh it, it goes with the the one i did share about um don't ignore your first thought mm -hmm. because sometimes it's like, Oh, you know, you know, what if we did this? Ah, that's dumb. I should, no, it's not dumb. So get it out. Let your, let your creative director tell you it's dumb. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, you know, and people used to tell me too, like, see, I, this is where you can debate it. It's like, how much should you revise yourself? Because I do believe revision is, is a tool. 
um, especially when you're writing that you, that, you know, when people, um, you want to ask people to write lines and they come back with like 80 and I'm like, you couldn't really narrow this down, uh, more than 80. It's not helpful. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. I got to do that. You know, so you don't want to come in too short or too long, but you know, I, I always had a rule for myself when, when delivering lines to uh, a creative director, which was fill the page, just a page of, of great lines. So I would really sweat which ones made it, but I would give them enough options, but, but I would make sure that I could stand behind all of them. Basically. I love having a, I love having a quantity to go for. I love creating that limit for yourself too. And yeah. that goal for yourself. That, I should try that. You know what I do? I, I look at the, I do it based on the clock. Okay. Which is okay, I suppose. But what if yeah. you're like hitting a groove? At, I, I've actually, I hate to admit this. This happened to me recently because I'm working on two big projects, two different clients now. And I got to the point where it's like, I'm done with my hour. <laughs> I'm going to go for a walk or whatever. But like, I probably should have stayed in this chair for another bit. But that stuff comes to you when you're walking. But it yeah, does, it's great. It does. Plus, plus the page is cool because if you have two pages that you can actually really critically analyze your own work. That's really, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing about your list that I thought was cool too was how fucking on point it all was and you know so you, on your resume it does say that you've you've taught for a while I got, i'm i assuming on and off at miami ad school in san francisco i actually taught at miami ad school for four years pretty much straight through wow. like i totally burned myself out doing it um but i did do that i just kept doing it because it was kind of like it was you know when when work was a bummer it was nice to go over there and see their like excited faces and it was a little bit of money in the pocket and then and then eventually like it was getting i was getting to the point in my career where I was like on production a lot and it was getting yeah. a lot harder just to, to make it work. To commit and, to it, right? Yeah, and, and, and then I was at that, probably at a certain point in time, I was making enough where the money didn't matter, so. What did you, what, good. Yeah. What did you like about it and what kind of feedback did you get from students about um, your role in their development? God, you know, I had, it's funny. Um, I, I, what did I like about it? Um, you know, I guess I liked what all teachers like are just having some of those breakthrough moments with students when they really got it. Um, I liked, you know, I taught a lot of, uh, writers early on. So I, I felt like I was able to shape mm. the way they wrote and just give them some of the, the basics. Um, and, um, you know, I had one student, Catherine, who I think is, I, I'm Canadian. I don't know, remember her last name, but she, she worked with Kasha. Remember Kasha? Yeah, Haupt, of, of course. course. Of course. Um, she was Kasha's partner for a while and she wound up at Gray. I think she's doing well. And she used to tell me, um, she'd have to psych herself up to come in the room for her first quarter writing class with me because she was so nervous. Mm. Um, so I was like, oh, okay. Like I was just very honest and blunt with, with people, you know, I, I sort of wanted to catch the bad habits early and, and nip them in the bud. And, um, uh, you know, she, you know, I was proud cause she, she went on to have some success. Um, other, I saw other of my students showing up at Goodby. So, you know, I felt good about that. I don't know her. But I would guess that the nerve, the nerve, I, I believe this and I would love for anyone to, I'd love to talk about this with anyone who feels nervous when they're walking into anything that is it, I feel like a student who's, who's, who's developing is sort of scared of what they're going to learn about themselves. They're sort of scared that the light on the mirror is going to happen and they're going to either be revealed as frauds, possibly, or they're going to be just flat out. I guess it's the same thing, flat out incapable of doing the thing. And there's that fear that goes away when you start to realize you can and goes away when you start to see this teacher who like is intimidating. I mean, you could be intimidating um, as a guy. He's a dude who's also just figuring shit out, but he's been doing, he's been messing around for a little longer than you have. That's pretty much the only qualification. And also, I, cause I share this in, in, in common with you. I hate bad work. Like I really hate it. Like, I believe that bad work in our industry is is, a, is a, the equivalent of pollution. It's of the pollu sense, I've used the pollution word. of the senses. I've used the word, yeah. Um, you know, and um, so so I, I really am passionate when I when I see bad work, and I, and and so I feel like you know if, if I'm teaching, I'm in the position to prevent more of that from going out into the world. What you know? is? It's bad because it's a bad strategy. It's bad because it's, they didn't bother writing it better. Is it yeah, bad? I mean, I mean, there's so many forms of bad. It's just like it's you know you see it all the time because you're constantly subjected to work to advertising and it's like oh that oh that's like corny. That's a pun. That's just stupid. You know, lazy. Like they didn't try. Um, you know, and and then they think like that just because they they bought this uh, little bus shelter that they're going to like, you know, um, actually convince people of something. It's, you know, it's just, and then, and then you see the work where, you know, 
And we recognize this that like, wow, a lot of work and thinking went into that. That's really, that's really something. Mm -hmm. I remember like just being in San Francisco and seeing the stuff show up around. Um, it was, uh, I I have the hardest time remembering the name of this agency, but they did, um, the anti vaping stuff, Mm -hmm. you know, and it was, they were basically saying that the tobacco industry has a new audience. It's kids. Yes. And they positioned all the work as like, you know, candy, bubble gums. Right. I mean, it was immediate, it was so immediately sticky and on point. And, you know, that's when I'm like proud to be yeah, a part exactly. of that, you know? Yeah. It's a frustrating thing, I think, for a lot of creative directors who teach. When you have that visceral negative reaction to bad work, you have to teach the team. And I think that the, te- the skill that I've had to develop is, is being able to tease out an idea from a bad ad. And so, and, and, and I'd say it's eighty percent of the stuff in early quarters is not good, but there's really good underlying yeah. thinking in it. Yeah. So the, the point here is now for us to craft these these professionals that they can identify what their idea is, and then start the sort of execution iteration part of it. And that's that's not something that's innate in us. We think, especially young people now, they they don't draw a distinction between the idea and the thing that is the idea. Like the the thing is the idea because everything is sort of this immediate posts and whatever that like. That expression, the way I said it right then, is what it is. It's like, well, no, what you're, what it is, is could be something else. Could be said a yeah. whole other, a whole different. Yeah, way. I feel like I had a few of those moments this morning when I met with some of the seventh and eighth quarters, where they, you know, had a headline that was the idea, right? right? Because right, or or they had a tagline that was the idea, but they just didn't, they didn't, they weren't seeing it. They didn't bother. It was there, and it's that's an important thing to be able to do because it, it not only helps them. Um, get to better work but it like they i think they can feel like oh it was close mm-hmm. you know it's a it's a boost to, the, to their confidence i think it's like you know it's not there yet but you're you're dancing around something really interesting here it's that and that's like really hard to understand what then what do i do what you do is you just keep trying to re, re, re-express it i always the gold standard for me advertising campaign of like i guess there's an idea in it but like yeah. the work that went in after the idea is the uh Dos Equis most interesting man in the world campaign mm. From a Euro, I guess, Euro with uh, Jeff Kling and I think Paul Fix worked on it. Rick Cohen, I think, worked on it. Because when you watch those commercials and there's like 10 one-liners, they've written close to a thousand one-liners. Yeah. There's the picture, the video's beautiful. They all, they all land. Everything but, is like, yeah. they didn't just write those yesterday. No. <laughs> they worked no, on they them for not. months. No, and that's what I meant today about like, no one needs to know how bad you suck at this if you keep revising. All right. That's a great point. Yeah. Um, so another thing you said today to the students, which I was looking around the room for like the kid in my class that asked me the question, this kid, Nick asked me the same question and you answered it the exact same way I answered it. And they said like, what kind of projects should be, you said the kind of projects you need to show in your, in your book need to be boring everyday projects, right? Not, not like really cool stuff. Well, um, um, I said, well, here's, well, where do I begin with this, right? Based on like what I'm, what, what, what we're seeing in books. I saw, I've been seeing a lot of like mobile apps, like, and like pages upon pages, like laying out how a mobile app works. And so I, on the one hand, I'm impressed that they put that together. On the other hand, I'm like, this isn't really doing anything for you. Mm -hmm. Like you can probably get this down to a page, even if it's worth being in your book. Um, You don't need to build out a mobile app. No one's hiring you to build out a mobile app. Trust me, we want you to write uh, and to think that's it. Mm-hmm. And so this notion that like, ah, I don't want too much print or print is dead. Like that is all just bullshit. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, we, we still make print. And like I said, when you take a print ad and you put it on a mobile screen, it's mobile. So there right. you go. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think what I said too, is that like someone had asked about like, or do you just like lean into what you're good at or you show a range? And I think it's important that you show a range Because imagine, you know, you're not just going to work on Cheetos, you know, you're going to work on some heavier stuff too, um, some challenging stuff. Uh, And so you need to be able to flex and write in a different voice. And I think that's something that I I had a bit of a skill at was just like, you know, being able to get into the voice of a brand, you know, and and, and, and of a character, a brand's basically a, a person. So it's like understanding characters. Yeah. The other question was about, product choices in your portfolio and you were saying stay away from like the and my answer to them was don't do the inherently interesting things that the ads are just what it is is already so interesting that you haven't shown that you can solve a difficult problem isn't that didn't we call that wasn't that called joy pop? Had, i remember yeah, hetty saying like yeah there's a pop. term in school i think that only existed in this building which was joy pop which was like the the sort of 
inherently fun, interesting products and brands. And um, that doesn't show that you can solve problems. That shows that you can just illustrate what something interesting already is. So th- that, that I thought was interesting too. So can we talk about your career? Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering, because we haven't talked in a while, um, what were the, the impetuses, impeti, impetuses of the moves that you've made? So um, w- without throwing any agencies under any buses, which mm-hmm. I'm assuming knowing the kind of guy you are, there weren't burnt bridges, but like what was the thing that got you to want to leave Goodby Silverstein and Partners? What was the thing that lured you to DDB, the most recent move? Um, talk a little bit about how you've navigated your career. There's a, a speaker who was here, I think it was last week or a couple weeks ago, who referred to to your job as a professional, as you're the CEO of your own career, right? You have to manage your own career from the top. So what were the things that you, that that made you or encouraged you to, or ultimately tipped the scales for you to make moves? Yeah, um, I think with Goodby, you know, that was my first job and um, it was such a fantastic place to work. Um, and I had no reason to leave it. Uh, and I was getting great opportunities there. I really loved the people, the work. And, um, and then I think, uh, about four years, close to five years in, they were just going through a bit of a lull. Like, you know, they, they had, they had gotten very big with Chevy and Sprint, I think close to 700 and then, and then completely, uh, collapsed once they lost some of those bigger pieces Mm -hmm. of business. And, um, I said goodbye to a lot of friends there. Um, it was a temporary collapse FYI. It was temporary. Yeah. De- definitely. And no, I, and I remember too, uh, um, when they called the all agency and we were just talking about rich, um, you know, he said, he said, all right, you know, he spoke, speaking to everybody that survived the layoffs. He's like, I'm glad, you know, what? I'm, 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 I'm glad we're small again. This is good. This is lean. And I, I kind of felt like that's oh, a little insensitive, right? Cause a lot of people just lost their jobs, but he, they were kind of happy to get back to, to being a little lean and mean. That's, that's mm-hmm. where they, that was a sweet spot for them. But in terms of me, um, yeah, I, I had been working on Comcast. Like they were getting very safe with the work they were doing. I remember having someone there who was a, um, a CD and a mentor to me. He said he said something like, "You're not going to pad your book anymore being here." That was his advice. He was kind of t- telling me to move on. Uh, and then that's um, really great. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it really was a little bit of a, a kick. It, it's funny because like in my last uh, few months there, like Goodby started noticing me. You know, like, um, you know, the way it worked there is like you were either on their radar or not, Mm -hmm. you know, but there were other great mentors. I mean, there was Jamie Barrett. um, He was there while you were there? He was there while I was there. And I I got to work with him on uh, some NBA stuff. I love Jamie. Jamie's great. Um, And um, also, uh, what's his name? Who's now at Ogilvy or Steve Simpson. Mm -hmm. I used to, I mean, I I grew up writing lines for Steve Simpson. Talk about like a tough critic. But you were at Harvard. Jesus. Um, but this was that, that, that that's what that was that was my training grounds mm-hmm. right um so <clears throat> you know yeah and goodby you know goodby i had his phone number and he was like calling me and 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 i was like okay on the one hand that's good but then yeah i, I did just, Je- jeff's phone number yeah okay. like never had jeff's you know and 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 we were you know he was, he was like noticed i was there all of a sudden and and um so um but i i was just i was just ready for something new and definitely like a new environment too and, mm-hmm. and an opportunity came up at gray um, and, uh, I didn't completely know what I was getting into. I, I got to tell you, I was extremely scared to leave Goodby because I just figured it could not be like that anywhere right, else. It right. just couldn't, it just mm-hmm. couldn't. And I went to gray New York, um, when Tor Mirren was running it. And, um, you know, I remember being there and like, I was like, what did I do? And I don't think I like these people. They're not very warm. Like there's no, none of that West coast mentality. It's like, and man, I turned out to love that experience. Like I just, I, I was part of a great group there. I had another, I found another great mentor and um, Jeff Stamp, who is I think a co-CCO there now. Um, you know, some people that it, I was just having this conversation the other day. It's not where you work, it's who you work for. Absolutely. That makes all the difference and they bring out the best in you. And um, I actually would have stayed there longer, but uh, life happened and, and my wife was pregnant and it was time to come back to San Francisco where she worked. Right. And I and 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 Gray was nice enough to transfer me um, as a known entity to help their SF office, which was struggling. And that was my first experience being part of a agency that was just. Um, I mean, the best way to describe that was shit show. Okay. <laughs> um, and anyone who's who who came through those doors knows exactly what I mean. Right. And they know who I'm talking about, and I won't name names. But um, 
so I saw a completely other side to doing business that I'd never seen before. And I couldn't mm. even believe it. Um, you could have, man, you could have written a, I even said sometimes I should start writing stuff down. This could be a book. Oh, you need to do it. Lisa and I have said that forever. Lisa I'm, and I have, I mean, the characters, just the characters that we, Oh, have. there were, I mean, no, I mean, we, we can talk off the record, but, but, uh, um, and we will. Yes. And, um, you know, yeah, it, like I was, I was like, wow, this is sad. And, and so, Actually, eventually everybody got laid off there um, because they just lost all the business. It was just mm-hmm. poorly managed. And yeah, I tried, I tried giving New York heads up. I, I knew the management, they knew me, but they, they were just not, their tension wasn't there. And, and, um, and I actually went back to Goodby to freelance for, for a bit with, with David Suarez and Danny Gonzalez, mm-hmm. who did all that great work at um, Barton Graff. And, and, you know, it's funny how just like where life takes you. And I got a chance to work with these guys. I never else would have. That's awesome. And made, uh, I showed some of the work today, made some stuff for the NFL. Got to, you know, uh, have them shape the way I thought, their quirky sense of humor. And um, then DDB came calling. So the NFL spot, um, the sponsored NFL spot for domestic violence, was that a gray with Lance? That was a gray with Lance. Okay. When that happened, so for those of you who might have missed this on the Super Bowl, I want to say this was... Five years ago, 15, 2015? 2015. Um, there was a, a just a chilling commercial for uh, domestic violence. That is a, a woman's phone call to nine one one, and um, you. I thought that was really humble and sweet the way you put it today, saying that like the stuff that you do, you see it, but what it ends up being can often be. Um, bigger halo like Mm. the reach of the radiation of that thing can actually be bigger than you ever imagined it would be talk to me a little bit about because i was curious when it was happening i remember contacting you and lance at the time talking about the spot but what was it like going through this where like you were you know co-creator of something that was so significant so so big that they ran it on the super bowl and it got a lot of press a lot of pr and it was it's an absolutely amazing commercial so talk about what the experience was like from your own personal perspective well, it's, you know, it's funny because we all, we all want our, our loved ones and our, our parents to admire the work we do. Right. Um, that was one that like my mom was so proud of. Um, you know, I think, um, like you said, it had a powerful message behind it. It answered the question like, like why, oh, if, if uh, you're living with someone that's uh, um, not treating you well, abusing you, why don't you just leave? It, answer, it kind of answered that question. Um, but that process was amazing because, um, you know, I brought it up today as, as an example of sometimes the worst briefs are the best. And in 2015, um, we were, everybody wanted the brand spot, the brand spot, the 60, um, Marcus Gartrell was there working on it at the time. I think actually his spot is the one that, that won out. Good job, Marcus. Good job, Marcus. And, uh, uh, you know, those were, those tended to be fun, unapologetic celebrations of football. Um, but there was this other brief out there um, for, you know, the, the, the league had been struggling with a lot of the players um, having, you know, dealing with domestic violence allegations. And they wanted to kind of like put something out there just to remind people that they, they did not think that was okay and they were committed to um, improving that. And, and that's, a, that's not just a, it's kind of a shitty brief. It's like domestic violence and, then, you know, the NFL and uh, for the Super Bowl. And, no, it's not, not really. that's, and that's a hard one too. No one's fighting over it. No, it's not, it, no, no. It's not dropped in the hall and it's a frenzy of people grabbing that no, piece of paper. No, there was another team, uh, good friends of mine who, who were working on it and had some good ideas. But um, we, we had happened upon this, this story that when just when you read the story, you got that feeling in your stomach. It just You were just like, wow. So then it became a question of like, can we do this? Did that come this? from planners? Or did y'all found that? No, we found it. Mm-hmm. We found it. I think it was, it was through Facebook. Mm-hmm. And um, um, so we knew it. We had it. You know, it was when we shared it with our ECDs and, and tour. It was all the same reaction. It was like, we got to do this. It's funny. It was kind of like the script was there. So it was like, you know, um, how do we, this is what I meant today too, about like, you're not just a writer. Like my, I was using, I was, I was wearing different hats on this. So I was like, right. I was, I was directing the actors. How do we, how do we do this? How do we cast it and direct it and make it sound like a real call? Oh yeah. No. So, so the spot is a 911 call where a woman, uh, is calling nine one one, obviously, and you hear both sides of the conversation. While you're seeing beautiful images panning of a of a of a, a home in slight disarray, mm-hmm. um, and the and the woman is um, acting on the phone as if she's ordering a pizza, because she can't reveal um, what's happening in the space. And the nine one one guy takes him a minute to come around to understanding it, but it's really really powerful because at the end he said we have an officer in your area, 
and she just hangs up and so that the person in the room doesn't know what she just did. Really, 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 really well done. I always thought it was real. Like I thought it was a recording. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the feeling we were we were going for, and that's not easy to do to make something that you know. I had, um, like I mentioned, I, we cast a real nine one one dispatcher to play that role to add authenticity, but we we had a, ca- a cast uh, an actress to play the woman, and that was even more challenging she was to really make her good. Yeah, and and um, and th- you know, I remember too. It's funny because uh, one of the other things I mentioned today was like. Don't be don't be precious and open yourselves up to, to people making your work better. And I just thought the way to do that spot was to run the audio like on black, like no like no visual. Like all of a sudden the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Imagine that. Like you're all these spots and all this like candy for the eyes, and all of a sudden it goes black and you hear audio. And I just thought that was the answer. And Tor came around and said something to the effect of like, no, man, like it's a Super Bowl. Like you gotta bring you gotta bring something visual. Like it's just, and I was like, what really? And look, I mean, he knew what he was talking about. Like we, we eventually told that, that I just wasn't, I remember sitting in the edit and going, is this going to work? Like with the audio over picture, like did we lose something along the way? But somehow there's a weird tension with the picture. Yeah. There's a weird sort of makes you, it makes you uncomfortable. It made me uncomfortable and 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 an effective good one. And that's when you have to just trust people that just have more experience. And I think John Hancock ran some great stuff years ago on black screen voiceover stuff that's yeah. it's kind of not that it's been done but it's not as breakthrough so that was, so what was it explain like were you aware that it was big did it become big enough to where it affected sort of like i don't know were you getting a lot of contact like what explain to me how yeah. that either affected you in, the, in that short term or or your own sort of career path or whatever and yeah and then i want to circle back to the bad brief part of it but yeah no um besides just that your mom knew, knows what you do and liked it which is which is enough sure <laughs> sure sure i mean i mean this was my mom this is you know i remember i gave up a career as a lawyer oh fair to yeah. do this you gave a career as a jewish lawyer as a, right so uh <laughs> redeemed but um i for the week leading up to the super bowl they rent you know as they do with super bowl ads they put it out there and um you know i wish i had the case study to play today because the anchor on CNN, I don't know, is her name Carol King? Is that this the, the the woman that writes songs or is it her too? She, she cheered up as yes, she played yes, it. Yes, right. um, this real honest moment of human emotion and that said it all. And then you had um, Ron Goldman's sister talking about how important this was. And, you, you know, it was a big deal for that for that week. It, but, but, you know, because Lance and I eventually went to a Super Bowl party, um, I, I, you know, hosted by the, the woman who ran the production company, Chelsea Pictures. I think. And, um, it came on like right before the halftime break. It was like, not such, it was such not a big deal. It was just mm. kind of came on and it was kind of like, okay, like go to the back. Mm. So, so really it was that it was all about that week leading up to the game. Um, and, uh, yeah. And I, you know, like the NFL, which obviously has a lot of PR issues, like this was a good moment for them. Like they got a lot of credit for this one. That's cool. And I remember hearing a story that, um, when they went to finally show it to Goodell, the commissioner, he was like, we're doing what now? Right. Oh yeah. I think I remember hearing this. And at that point he like, I, you know, the clients were like, no, it's too, we can't pull this. Like, I don't know if he, he suggested that or not, but they're like, it's at that point we're beyond that point at this point. So the interesting, interesting thing to me about the bad assignments is that I had one at Ogilvy, which was literally, I just slipped into Moira Rose, literally, (laughs) um, just re-editing some Hershey spot that someone else had written. Um, and then th- that led to re-editing some, Ver- it was called 9X, but now it's Verizon, some Verizon spot. And because we had re-edited that Verizon spot or re-jiggered it somehow, the brief came in for the next round of commercials. And the team that was on it was on a shoot. So like, well, you guys did that other thing, right? So here's the brief. Hmm. So doing that shitty one, and I always think of the shitty ones as, this, I just thought of this as sort of like the mortar that holds the bricks together. The the big everyone sees the bricks, but your career is built by with more than bricks. Yeah. So you get the opportunity to get those from doing the other ones. And uh, um, what you guys did, which I think was cool, is looking at it. Um, every creative's job is to look at it from an, from the from the back end or the top or some other angle, rather than just telling the story that the NFL stands behind these people. Like what can we? That's what they were doing up until that right. point. Right. What can we yeah. do to make people feel something? Yeah. So that's really cool. See, and this is the part of the bigger, the epic struggle of like getting marketers to like get out of their comfort zone. Like that was, you know, I give the NFL credit for putting that thing out there. Absolutely. Like, right. 
Um, and, and, and so it's, um, but, but people don't, especially now, like it feels like marketers don't like to take risks and they're, they're worried about, um, it coming back to hit them in the face, um, as it happens. But, 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 but really it's like, if we can figure out how to, how to bring them more into our, um, well, we, we, we do it now because like, like DDB literally believes that creativity pushes, moves business and they have the, the, you know, the evidence to prove it. And that's part of it because they're, they're kind of data driven people. Marketers are. No, it's easier. What would you, that standard commercial, would you want to share that with your friends? Like, would you want to share just the brand telling you we stand for it? Or would you yeah, want to share? Yeah. I, I can tell you for sure that that spot got shared. Yours got shared. Yeah. Yeah, it did. So that's what it's about. It's about also thinking about this from the audience perspective, entertaining them somehow, whether it's like in a, in a heavy way or, or a humorous way, um, for sure. So um, what what's your favorite part of your job now? Like, what do you enjoy about work, about your about your actual job? Um. I, I, I still kind of go like, I get, I hope, you know, none of my superiors listen to this, but like, like I get, I get paid to do this, like having worked in law and, 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 you know, I still think about that every now and then, especially when I work on something silly. Um, it's just not, you know, that's what they say. They say like, do what you love and you'll never work another day yeah. in your life. And, and it's true. Um, so I enjoyed that. Um, as my, my wife is like, you know, she's got a real job at, um, PlayStation, as I mentioned, and she, She'll say to me, she'll be like, I don't understand what you do. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, under, she doesn't understand my hours and, and, and that kind of thing. And, um, but, um, and then, you know, going back to don't be afraid to embarrass yourself. Like now more than ever, I'm doing that. Like I'm embracing that. Like I'm, nice. I'm throwing out first thoughts and things that cross my mind and things where I go, like I was telling you, you know, it's like, you know, we'll never get that celebrity. And I'm just, I don't care. I'm going to take a right. shot at it. Yeah. And, you know, and like, sometimes you do. That's a TBD folks. Yeah. Um, the, uh, so what's the frustration? So you sound like you like, are like, you sound like you're drunk and delusional that this is a fun industry. So what's the, uh, what's, what's the part of it that like, isn't awesome that you're, that you've learned somehow to manage or maybe you're just a positive dude and you don't experience life the same way I do. I'm not a positive dude. Um, uh, I, you know, it's at the same time, it's, it's hard. It's hard to make stuff. It's, I think it's harder than it's mm -hmm. ever been in my career. Um, I haven't been on production in a long time and that, that's, as I wanted the students to know today, that's the best part. Yeah. That is the best part. Mm -hmm. That is a, it's, it's amazing. And, um, it's been a while for me, uh, and we're trying to build something and grow something in San Francisco. We're small. Uh, and we're, we're trying to get off the ground with some of that work. And so like, we're it, with the good part of it is that like, we're open to big thinking and taking big swings, but it, it's a, it's a struggle. Like it's, it, it takes time. And you know, the other thing I've realized too, is that like, you just, you need luck. Like even the NFL mm. thing, like, like was just, it was lucky that we found the story. It was lucky that like Goodell didn't like kill that thing. Like, I mean, you really do like there's talent and that's part of the ingredients. I would say luck is part of the ingredients. Yeah. Like you, you know, you need your celebrity to be available and say yes. Like all the stars have to align in order for there to be great work. So what's the struggle now? The struggle is building the agency, finding clients, continually doing good work, firing good, finding good people to hire. Like what's the Def struggle part? Yeah, it's it, it's def it's uh, good you mentioned that. Like it, it's definitely fi finding talent. Um, as I look at a dead cockroach on the floor. What? Um, that's all right. Where is it? It's right there. Oh, I'm gonna have to take a picture of that for people that are okay. paying attention to both the Instagram. And the podcast. So they I wish that came up as I was talking about dead, dead ideas. Um, but um, uh, what's hard about it is, man, like clients are tough. Like we have some, we, we have some tough clients. We've had, a, we've had a couple uh, clients come through the doors that like the relationship just didn't work out. Like they, mm -hmm. they abused us good. And then it was just, and then, and then thank God, like DDP said, uncle, we're done. We're not right. doing this anymore. Yeah. And, and um, our clients now, like we, we definitely, um, we appreciate them as, as people and um, we like working with them, but we're really trying to get them to take some chances. Yeah. And, and um, you know, it's funny because like, like they'll come to us and they'll say, what well, I want my fearless girl. Like, where's my, th yeah, you know? Right. And then, and then like they, they don't kind of live up to that. Like as you get in, you know, and you have to, they you, weren't in that meeting when someone pitched that and the client was like, wait, what? Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's the thing. How do you think fearless girl happened? Like I, I, I no one knew it was going to be received like right. that. I heard at one point it wasn't even a girl. It was a cow. Right. I, I mean, this is the strange thing about our business, but, um, somebody was at least willing to try it. Like right. you gotta be, just throw some things out there, try it. Uh, and, and so that's, what's 
challenging is like we know we have to make a lot of the hardworking pieces and sell the products and 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 but we need to find moments we try to find moments to like throw something out there right, like absolutely. experiment a little bit because the way uh brit nolan put it recently he visited our office he's our north america cco he's like it's like crack he's like once you give them a little taste and it mm-hmm. works they're addicted yeah that's great and the best cmos know that and they want more of it that's great so what personal trait of yours what is it about you that served you best so far what what is the thing about you that you think is your best either weapon or trait well i said i said my superpower today uh at forum i said it was revision um I'll keep going until I feel like it's, it's great. That's cool. Um, you know, and that, you know, I, I, I have respect for the craft of writing. I did as a lawyer too, cause I had a good mentor there who made me really respect it and think about how I was constructing an email. Um, so I, I would say that, that for sure. I, I think I have, uh, I think when it, you know, it's funny cause like, um, the Super Bowl spot, the NFL spot was so not funny, but I, I pride myself on being able to do funny. I think mm-hmm. funny, funny is hard. Hard. Um, but like as Gibby once told me, he's like, when all else fails, be funny. That's the best way to cut through if you yeah, can do great. it. You know? That's great. Um, and finally, knowing what you know, knowing what you know now, if you could go back to uh, whatever year it was that you left school, two thousand eight, I would buy Bitcoin. You would tell yourself to buy Bitcoin. That's what you yeah. whisper in young Steve's ear. Probably buy, was that buy yeah. Bitcoin? Yeah, in twenty thirteen before. It... Mm-hmm. Okay. No, no. What's the question? Sorry. I, what would you whisper in young Steve's ear? Oh, what, what would you tell yourself? What do you wish you'd known? Um, when I started school, when you left school. When I left, when I left gra- school. The day you graduated from school, yeah. Um, uh, I, I would say I would say take more chances. Mm. I would say take more risks. Absolutely. Um, that's just something that it takes it takes time. You you don't think like that's the way. Like it almost sounds oh, a little right. irresponsible, right? Um, but. But it, it can be, and and to your point, don't be afraid to embarrass yourself because, like, what's the word? They're not going to fire you. That's what because he says. Frankly, that's probably what they're paying you for, right? To bring the thing that no one would have thought of. Yeah, it's like the weirdest one. Yeah, I mean, maybe, but for sure to try it. Yeah, I mean, like, I can I can be the straight guy and I can do the hardworking stuff, no problem. But like, I also like to be able to be, you know, like silly and 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 wacky, like especially if a brand calls for it. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I like. I have pride in being able to like change the channel and switch gears. That's great. That's yeah. awesome. Well, thanks so much for talking. Thank you. It's good to be back. Listeners, I forgot to say this at the beginning, but there is an Instagram. It's DGMS Podcast. Podcast is also now on SoundCloud. You have to search DGMS Podcast on there. And evidently there was already one, another <laughs> in DGMS Podcast, but it is on there. You can reach me as always at Dan's Podcast at Mac.com. Um, Every episode is available on Spotify. Every episode is available on uh, the iTunes store, the podcast store, and Balsterville.com. There's lots of ways to find this. And I I don't know why I'm bothering telling you, the one person who has already found it, but share, share, spread the love. Um, And um, again, man, thank you so much for talking. Yeah, yeah. This has been great. Listeners, thank you guys. Uh, We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. See you.